Well, good morning once again to you. Uh, I'm excited to bring us our next installment of our Advent Christmas series, The The King is Coming. And uh, as we all know, Christmas is coming. It's a week and a half, two weeks away. If you got kids, I'm sure they're letting you know time and time again that Christmas is coming. They're excited about it. My kids are excited about it. And I was thinking about my own context regarding Christmas coming and the King coming and celebration of that. And I, I realized that there's a lot of positive highs that are happening in my home surrounding Christmas. I I think about a gift buying for my children, and me and my wife were able to spend a time away, like a marathon shopping day last Saturday, which I was beat afterwards, but, you know, it was just just a a good Christmas high that we had. We we don't get a chance to spend a lot of time with one another. And it was good to go out and be with her. I think about uh, my kids and their excitement around Christmas and their desire uh, to get everything decorated. My uh, middle child, Layla, we spent some time outside at the beginning of last week, hanging up Christmas lights out in the cold, and we just had a good time. And then lastly, this week at our, at our house is uh, Cookie Week. And so my wife and my kids will be making some cookies. I'll be eating some cookies, amen. Um, And so I'm excited about that. And uh, a personal thing, like we haven't been uh, with a full kitchen at my house because of uh, water damage since like the end of August. And the contractor's finished yesterday. And I'm like, yes, right on time for Christmas. And so I'm excited about that. And there was a low with that. Actually, I was moving the refrigerator back around the corner and I got it into the kitchen and my, my toddler or push past me to go past the bathroom. I yanked the refrigerator real quick and I severed the water line on the refrigerator and shh, water, like the water works. And I'm like, Lord, please, this is why we had to get a new kitchen. Things are just, uh, we, uh, things were just all over the place. I got the valve off and everything is good. But all that to say is there are some highs that are attached to the Christmas season, hope and joy in peace like Pastor Gordon talked about. And over the past couple of weeks, uh, Joe has pointed us to some high points about Christmas that uh, directly are written in Philippians 2, this poem that Paul wrote that talks specifically about this unfathomable and divine reality of God coming to earth as man, yet still fully God. Uh, This beautiful gift of the baby Jesus who came to earth for us. And these words, as we've looked at Philippians 2, they've spoken to uh, Christ's humility. Uh, It's spoken to Christ's obedience. Uh, It's spoken to Christ's love and the hope that we have in him. Um, And as we continue in this poem today uh, that is found in Philippians 2, we're going to begin to see Paul kind of switch up some of his verbiage in this verse that we're now adding through this series of verses that we're unpacking. He's transitioning his words from speaking about Christ coming to us to now speaking about Christ's cross. First, he's speaking about Christ coming to us as man, and now he transitions his word to speaking about Christ leaving this earth by way of the cross. It's where Christ left the highest of heights and went obediently to the lowest of lows. If you got your Bible with you or your smart device, I'm gonna, you can join me. We're gonna look back at Philippians 2, and I'm gonna uh, start us back in verse five, where we kind of began our series, verse five and, five and verse six, and then we'll add on verse eight as we continue in our series today. You got it? It'll be available by side screens as well. The word says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Again, verse 8, our new verse for this Sunday says, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now, as we look at verse eight here in Philippians two, we see Paul again connect and intertwine Christ's lowering of himself into human likeness as a baby to the pouring out of himself on the cross. Paul says that God came and he not only humbled himself and took human appearance, but he was fully obedient 
to death, even death on the cross. And that's what we're actually going to look at today. We're going to look at how the king's cross is directly connected to the king's trough. The cross and the trough, they're connected to one another. And we see that in Jesus' birth and in his early years as a baby, as a toddler. And in both cases of the trough and the cross, we will see that Christ experienced suffering. And it's like, wow, what a, what a to- topic to talk about during Christmas. Suffering and, and the cross, too. Like, this is an Easter, Jeff. This is Christmas. And I, I'm aware of that. They're connected. But it's important for us to realize that, yes, there's joy and there's hope. And we're going to talk about that this morning as well. But it's good for us to also be reminded that Christ experienced suffering at the beginning of his life, not just at the end. And to get an understanding of how Christ experienced a suffering at the beginning of his life, we need to kind of get a grasp of the context of the environment and the time in which he was born in. Uh, he was king. We know that. His mother and father, Mary, knew that. His earthly father, Joseph, knew that he was king. But as we know and as they experienced, he was not ushered into this world with lavishness. He wasn't ushered into this world with fanfare like we're accustomed to. Like if there's a socialite or a celebrity that has a baby, we know about it. People celebrate it. They post about it. Like we know about it. And as I thought about that, uh, I started to think about the birth of uh, Prince William and Kate Middleton's first child. Do you remember that? It's almost 10 years ago now. And when People found out that she was in labor and had this baby. The world blew up. I've got some pictures to remind us, like, what happened when she gave birth to this baby boy? Like, this is in New Zealand. This is at a famous opera house and event center. Like, if you look at the event center, it's all in blue. And if you look into the background, you can see some other buildings in blue. It simplified what was happening with the birth of their first child. You see some other slides here. This is in London and the bridge and, and, and the rides and everything. In Toronto, the CNN, to- the CN Tower, and here at Niagara Falls in the United States, The falls were all painted in blue. There was just this great excitement. If you look here, this is actually her private wing. This is paparazzi. The press conference is about to happen because people got word that this baby was coming and then Buckingham Palace, like she's not even there. Like this is not where she's even having the baby at, but there's just scores of people ready to celebrate. And they said that Lexuses and Bentleys came in front of the Buckingham Palace and people were just excited about the birth of this baby and him having his own private suite to be born in. And as we know, this isn't what happened with Christ. There wasn't this huge fanfare. You know, the shepherds came initially, but there wasn't this huge fanfare. And he didn't have his own private wing. He was actually born in a cataluma, is the Greek word, a cataluma, which is basically the guest stables of more than likely one of Joseph's relatives' homes. And the Cataluma, it was used for many things, including keeping your animals in for them to rest and to eat out of troughs and mangers. And this is where Jesus was not only born, but it's where he spent his early months in his first year or two. He didn't have a home of his own. There wasn't fanfare. There was no palace. There was no private wings. And it's important for us to also know that this Cataluma space was more than likely inhabited by other relatives that were in Joseph's family who had all come back to Bethlehem for the senses. And this is where Jesus spent his early life, crammed into one space with animals and relatives and other people. He was raised and born in those early times in poverty amid lowly people. This was his coming to earth. But it wasn't just the physical place where Jesus was born and raised in the early months where he experienced some burden and some suffering and some heartache. It was also the culture of leadership that he was born into and the cultural context of the country at the time of his birth. See, Jesus, he was born at the time of Herod the Great. Has everybody heard of Herod the Great? Herod the Great, okay, he was a vindictive, paranoid, murderous, power-driven, oppressive ruler, to put it lightly. He had all of these different things working for him personality-wise, and Jesus was born into his rulership. He was born to a culturally obscure people who were greatly troubled and unsettled and actually disturbed when they heard that he was born. 
He was born into a cultural context among teachers of the world, religious men, who were aware of his coming and even his birth, but they didn't even care to come and worship him and adore him. This is what Jesus was born into. And there is burden and suffering in those things as well. And we see these realities in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And it's a familiar part of the Christmas story for us, but it also breaks down some of these things that I just shared. I'm going to share this word with us today. It's available by screens. It says this, Matthew 2, starting in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. Now moving to verse 7, it says, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. As it continues in verse 11, it says, On coming to the house, the Magi, they saw the child with his mother Mary, They bowed down, they worshiped him, they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, he took the child and his mother During the night, he left to Egypt, and then finally in verse 16, it says, When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Now, again, there's a lot to unpack in this passage, and again, undoubtedly, we've heard this in our lives as part of the Christmas story, but there's a couple things that I want to point to specifically. First, with the Magi. These are a group of guys, probably more than three guys, as we're accustomed to knowing, more like a caravan of guys who were astronomers and uh, uh, philosophers, and they were interested in things of the future. They were interested in things to come, and so they were aware of the prophecy of a king to the Jews, king of the Jews, coming to be born. And so they come and they travel, and as they arrive to inquire about the baby who had been born several months, several months before, who was king of, to the, king of the Jews, they were surprised to find that not only is Herod not aware of the birth, but nobody else is aware of the birth either. Like, nobody knows what is going on. This thing that they had heard about in the East, nobody else was aware of. And not only does no one else know, it says that along with Herod, All of the people in Jerusalem were disturbed about hearing about this birth. Now, of how I've described Herod before, we would know that he would be disturbed by it. He was a jealous ruler. He ruled with an anxious and power-sucking rule, and they called him Herod the Great because they said he had great policy and he built great buildings, but people of the day called him great as well because they knew that he was great at murder. Just to keep it straight, he was great at murder and torture. So he was great in these dual efforts. Like, for context, Herod killed his favorite wife, history says, because he thought that she was plotting to take his kingdom. History also says that he killed two of his sons because he thought that they were plotting to take his rulership. And then when he found out that his other son lied about those two sons taking his kingship, he killed that son too. This is how Herod was. And so he would have not taken lightly to the fact that a baby was born king of the Jews, not prince, not king to be. People were saying, this is the king, not you, the king has been born. It says all the people were disturbed at his disturbance because of the potential outbursts that might happen. They knew that when he got disturbed, something was going to go down. 
And so they were disturbed, and a great murmuring and whispers like a game of telephone start going through Jerusalem and the surrounding towns, and an unsettling rested upon the people, and more than likely the people in Bethlehem as well. Again, later in the passage, we saw that after the wise men, they found Jesus, and they went and they worshiped him, and they gave him gifts. They departed, and then immediately an angel from the Lord, it came to Joseph, and it told him of all the disturbances that were happening in Jerusalem and with Herod. All of that stuff was going to come to a head, and Jesus was going to be killed. Herod was going to kill this king. And this plot led to a nighttime escape through Egypt by the way of a young couple who was more than likely gripped with fear, anxiety, and uncertainty. It's a lot to unpack there, but why is all of this significant as we talk about Christ's suffering at his coming? The place where he was born, the environment that he was living in in his early days and early years, where there's a couple things. First, has to do with the anxiety and stresses that a child feel. Studies show that babies and toddlers are affected by their environment, and they are not only aware of environmental stressors, but they can also feel secondhand stress. They can feel it. These studies indicate that prior to six months, babies can begin to be impacted by overstimulation, where settings, routines, uh, surroundings are completely unstable. It's kind of like being in a cataloom with a bunch of people <laughs> and young parents and farm animals eating all around you while calling a trough your crib. Jesus would have experienced some stress and some trouble and some suffering even at a tender age. Studies also indicate that within three to five months, babies can become actively aware of sadness, fear, anxiety, and worry of their caregiver. Kind of like the sadness, the fear, the anxiety, the worry that Jesus' parents must have felt in hearing the murmurs about Herod wanting to come and kill and then having to escape in the dark to a foreign land. I'm sure that they felt anxiety and stress and that caused suffering in their son Jesus. If you add to both of these things the fact and the reality that Christ was king, he was God in flesh, thus he knew even at infancy, at infancy that the rulers, the religious people of the day knew of his coming, yet they still didn't come to worship him. It must have broke his heart. And in all of these things, family, we see that the Savior King, Christ Jesus, even at the time of his coming, experienced burden, pain, and suffering in the same ways that you and I feel it. And as I thought about that over this week, preparing for today's talk, I asked this question, why, Lord? Like, why would you come into suffering knowing that at the end of your life, you were going to have to suffer? Like, it was part of the plan for you to come and to save us, and you were going to give up your life on the cross. But why would you enter into a home setting, a cultural setting, an environmental setting, where there was so much suffering? And then the Lord led me to this reminder. Christ entered into a season, a time, a culture, an environment of personal suffering, so that he might show us that he knows what it's like when we're experiencing suffering and burden in our lives too, amen? You know, because Christ knew suffering from birth, because he knew burden, the reality is, is he can relate to your burden and your suffering, big or small. Because he knew those things of his own, he can empathize with our burdens and our suffering, big or small. And in his mercy, he says, you know what? Give those things to me. Since I've experienced suffering at the time of my coming all the way to my cross and in between, you can come to me in your moments where you've got small things, big things, in between things that are causing you to suffer. I want to shoulder those things. I want to hold those things. I want to draw you closer to myself. And that leads me and us to our first point for this Sunday morning, and that is let Christmas remind us of Christ's connection to our suffering. It's good to talk about hope and joy and peace that came, and those things are true. They are a part of Christmas. We rejoice during Christmas season because of those things, but we also should be mindful that our Savior King came into suffering so that he could connect to our suffering and draw him closer 
draw us closer to himself. As I was thinking about suffering in Christmas season, which is, again, a hard thing to try to play together over this past week and a half or so, I started to think about my family. And as we've been preparing for Christmas again, I talked about some highs. We've also been going through some lows. Over the past six weeks, we've got some news about my wife and also my oldest daughter that have just been unsettling. Some folks in this room, and they know that my wife has multiple sclerosis, and it's been a battle for almost 10 years. And uh, just a week and a half ago, she got some MRI results that said that her lesion had moved to her brain. And she's got an MS lesion on her brain, and the doctor said that it's live and it's active. And uh, for us, we, it was so, a bit of relief, even though it was sorrow-filled, because she has so many headaches that she didn't have before, nausea and mood swings. Things were just changing and there was just suffering going on. And I'll be real with you, I was so sad. Like I think I was so much more sad, I think, even than her. Just went to the room and cried when she she left the space. And there's just suffering in that for us because we know that she can be healed. She's been healed before, but it doesn't escape the fact that there's suffering and burden in the diagnosis. A few weeks before that, our oldest daughter, Amaya, she was also diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. The disease is so rare that the doctors down at Riley say, usually folks 60 to 65 old or older get this type of disease and she's only 12. Over the past couple of weeks, she's been poked on and prodded and they've given her a battery of tests and they're suffering in that. And there's burden in that. And just a couple of nights ago, I was downstairs and my wife was upstairs and we were texting each other. Y'all know how many of you guys ever do that, but like we're in the same house, we're texting. And she texted me and she said, you know what? In all of these things that are happening, I was just so proud of her. All these things that are happening, I really want to be angry with God. Like, I'm, I just want to be mad at him. I'm tired of the suffering. But every time I go to be mad at him and not want to pray, and I literally say, I'm not praying, I'm not going to do my quiet time, I instead feel the warmth of his smile, and I feel him actually embracing me and drawing me closer. And even though I came into my quiet time saying, I'm not praying, I'm mad at you, he draws me into these prayer times and these worship times, and he reminds me that in my suffering, there's hope. In my suffering, there is hope. And that's the same thing that Jesus said to us. And as I read that text and I responded to my wife, I was reminded of Hebrews 4.15 that says, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, with our suffering, with our burdens. We have a high priest who has experienced weakness. He's experienced suffering, and he comes close to us and then moves us in hope at the time of our suffering. Christ experienced suffering at the time of his birth, and it was just the beginning of the ongoing obedient acts of humility and humbleness that he entered into. Not only was he humble, as we learned about in weeks before, to come to earth as a man, not only was he humble to be born in an obscure, poverty-stricken place like we've learned about today, He was also humble as his life continued. He was humble in the companions and the disciples that he chose, like he chose lowly and ostracized people. He humbled himself, and they were suffering and being connected to them. He was humble in the long wait until he launched his ministry. And I can only imagine as he sat there and he saw suffering and and disconnection happening in the world, and he knew he was the answer, but yet he waited patiently, and he was humble in that as he saw suffering and felt it. He was humble in the temptations that he endured. Like, he didn't succumb to those temptations, but he had to have suffered. He was man. And then lastly, as we know, he was humble in choosing to submitting to be obedient to death. And this brings us all the way back to where we started at the beginning of our time today. It brings us back to Philippians 2.8. It brings us back to Christ's humbling of himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And when Christ went to the cross in obedience to suffer, he did so amid the same environment that he was in when he came to earth to suffer. Like, Like, catch this. Jesus went to the cross 
amid the times where rulers despised him and his kingmanship, just like it was when he was born. He went to the cross amid religious leaders who could care less to worship him, the same way that it was when he came to earth. And he went to the cross among people who were disturbed by his presence and wanted to see him crucified. And when he went to the cross, he went to a place that was meant for criminals. And as the Jews thought, those that were cursed, he went there to be mocked and spat at and shamed. It was the lowest of deaths of that day and time. A.T. Roberson, a preacher and writer from the 1800s and the early 1900s, he called the death of the cross the bottom rung in the ladder from the throne of God. Jesus came all the way down to the most despised death of all and condemned criminal on the accursed cross. Like, Jesus came all the way down from the highest of heights into suffering, only to go deeper into suffering by way of the cross, the very lowest rung that there could be. And in that, we see the connection from the trough in Bethlehem to the cross on Calvary. The savior of the world came to us in our form in the lowest of places through the trough and gave up himself in our form at the lowest of places, the cross, and experienced suffering in both those places. And as we look at the suffering that he experienced both at the trough and on the cross, we're reminded that there is no limit, not one limit at all, to what God will do to demonstrate his love and saving power for us. He would give up power, and we've talked about that in this series. He would humble himself and lower himself, and we've talked about that in this series. And today, we're reminded that he would suffer. There's nothing that Christ wouldn't do, wouldn't give up to demonstrate his love for us. And because Christ suffered at the cross, family, I want us to be reminded that now you and I, we can come to the cross in our moments of burden and our moments of suffering as well. Because he endured the cross, we can go to the cross. Because let's be real. Can we be real for a second? Like, even though it's Christmas, doesn't mean that some of us don't have burden in our life, that we're not experiencing pain. Some of us are. Some of us are in conflict with a spouse or within our family settings. Some of us are being held down by fear and worry or a decision that we're having to make. Some of us have a prodigal child that has gone wayward and the Suffering and the burden of that is so hard to deal with. Some of us have diagnosis in our minds and in our bodies that are presenting challenges for us. Perhaps there is a burden that is on your life, a suffering that's happening in your life because a decision that you've made, maybe recently or years before, and God is drawing you closer to himself. He's healing, he's restoring, but you can still feel the residuals of that decision that you've made. And it's not only affecting you, it's affecting other people. And there's this dual suffering that's happening in this. All of these things are burdens. They're sufferings, small, large, and in between. And they cause levels of personal suffering. But you know what? Christ was born and then obediently endured the suffering of the cross so that you again can come to the cross in those moments where you have suffering and burden in your life, whatever it is. That's our second point for today. Christ's obedience to the cross is an example for us to do the same. He was obedient to the cross and he invites us to be humble and obedient in our moments where we need him the most, where suffering is hard, where burden is heavy, and to come to him. We're nearing our close, but before we close, we're just gonna worship here for a moment. And as the worship team comes on, I wanna invite you to take a couple prayer-based postures. First, I just want you to pause as they worship, 
as we worship and as they sing over us and just think about the places where you have suffering and burden in your life. I want you to present those things to God, yes, but I also want us to be reminded that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came to men to heal, restore, to make things new in the places where we have suffering and burden because he experienced those things himself. Secondly, I want to speak to maybe a second group of us. I know that there are some folks in this room who are saying, listen, I know 2020 is hard, and I recognize that there are some hard things that are happening in community and people's lives, but really for us and my family, there's been breakthrough. There's been a lot of hope. There's been a lot of joy. There's been a lot of good things, and I don't want to overcalibrate to suffering. I want to acknowledge the fact that God is still on the move, and he's doing good things in people's lives. And so if that's you, can you just spend some time as we worship just thanking the Father for the hope that he's brought you, the breakthroughs that you've experienced in your life? And then maybe as the Spirit prompts you, can you then ask him and say, Lord, who in my community, in my circle, might have some burdens happening in their lives? I want to rejoice you for the hope and the breakthroughs I've seen and ask for you to move and show yourself faithful in their suffering. Let's worship.
Christ was born for you and I. And he came into the world and experienced suffering as he lowered himself to become like us for the purpose of seeking and saving the lost and saving us so that we might have life eternal. And he came and he experienced that suffering so that we might be able to come to him in the moments where we experience suffering and burden as well. Father, I thank you for that gift. I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who was born, as this beautiful song says, he was born, he came to earth for us, Lord, so that we might have peace, so that we might have hope, so that we might rejoice, but also so that we might have a savior that can relate to us in our times of trouble and need. Father, I pray that right now, as your sons and your daughters come humbly to you and the burdens that they have in their lives, as they come humbly to you, perhaps rejoicing for the places they've had breakthrough and then interceding for those they know that have suffering and burden, that you would hear from heaven and that you would remind them in this Christmas season that you are near, you're close, you're holding, and you provide a hope like nothing and no one else. May you mend, may you restore, may you heal, may you make things new with breakthrough. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? I want to thank you, brothers and sisters, just for coming this morning and look in a different, look in a different way at the, at the Christmas story. I pray that as we celebrate throughout these weeks that we would remember that Christ came to save us, but he also came to be close to us in all the things that we might feel. I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you as you have a great day and that you have a great day. I'll see you next time.